Okay, good evening. <coughs> Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you don't know how many people are out there in cyberspace, right? I know quite a few. Um, Simon Jacobson here, and I am here to speak about mob mentality. The topic you read, did read, right? <laughs> So the topic is mob mentality. Um, are we uh, are we influenced? How or how impacted are we by mob mentality? <laughs> by the herd mentality, and it's based on a uh, the theme, central theme of this week's Torah chapter, which is the story, the episode, the tragic episode of the scouts sent by Moses to uh, check out, scout out the promised land. So he chose, as the beginning of this Parsha begins, this chapter, chose the 12 best men, the leaders of the, of, uh, the tribes. So a leader of each tribe, and the, and the Torah delineates, spells out their names, and says clearly what kind of great leaders they were. And charged them with a mission to go to Israel, which was the land that the Jewish people were uh, traveling toward through the wilderness. And look, check out what's the best way to uh, conquer this land. You know, see before you go into the land to see there were people living there, they knew there were enemies there, they knew that people had occupied the territory since the Jews had left Israel many years earlier when Jacob and 70 souls went down to Egypt and ended up turning into the long exile. So hundreds of years have passed since then. So now they were returning, they went to check out how the best way to enter this land. And they came back with a uh, report, but this report ended up becoming tragic because they essentially claimed this land is un unconquerable. It's a land full of giants, full of powerful people. It's a land, as they put it, in those memorable words, a land that consumes its inhabitants. Eretz Echelish Yeshveh, the Torah tells us. A land that consumes its inhabitants. Which of course has many meanings, and I've discussed them over the years. Um, meanings that include, of course, the physical meaning, but also the psychological one, that it's a land of materialism. And materialism throughout history we see as a force that consumes its inhabitants. Everybody is affected, impacted by the tug and the power of material world, money, control, power, the competition, and so on. So the scouts came back with this report saying, we cannot enter, we cannot conquer, it's impossible. Basically, they defied God's promise. Essentially, if it was up to them, they would have remained in the wilderness and never entered this holy land. Except two people, two of the twelve, Kalov and Joshua, Caleb and Joshua, they stood up and said, no, God promised us this land, it's a good land, it's a beautiful land, a very good land, they said, and that we could conquer it, and we go with the promises, and with faith and trust, we'll be able to overcome any challenge. But they were silenced, they were almost killed by the mob that became enraged and, incite and were instigated by these ten leaders, so this becomes the first great tragedy in Jewish history. On Tisha B'Av, the Torah tells us this all happened on the saddest day of the year. Actually, this was the saddest day. This is why it became the saddest day of the year. That Tisha B'Av, when God said, you cried for slandering the land that I promised you, now this will be a day that you will cry for generations to come. And as a result of their great um, mutiny, the, every one of the people that left Egypt, with all the miracles, Every one of them, down to except Kalav and Yeshua, everyone died in the wilderness. God basically gave them their self-fulfilling prophecy. Since they said they don't want to go into the promised land, God said, okay, so you won't. And they all died in the desert in the next 40 years. And it was their children that would enter the promised land, led by Joshua. Even Moses ends up also remaining in the desert, in the wilderness. And all because of this mob uh, incitement. So... I thought appropriate, especially in context of I always try to focus on the relevant message and lesson to our lives today, 
you know, there are obvious lessons of how we make decisions. So I thought appropriate to talk about this idea of the herd mentality. Um, where <clears throat> asking the, the, uh, the blunt questions that are always difficult to really address, which is, where do you stand if the mob is going one direction and you, even if your conscience tells you it's wrong, what would you do? So of course, um, uh, most of us, you, know, you ask this question, if you saw 500 people marching in one direction and you don't even know where they're going, would you march along or would you ignore them and go your own way? If you saw 500 people uh, lynching, a lynch mob, going to lynch someone, would you participate or would you uh, stand alone, would you walk away? So most of us would answer these questions, especially since we like to think we're independent and free people, that you know, maybe the first group, I maybe march along because I don't know where it's going and I find out. But the second group, lynch mob, for sure I wouldn't join. Most of us would usually have that type of reaction, especially if you're a really fierce free spirit, fiercely independent, you would say, even the first group, I'm not, I don't just go along with people just because they're going that direction. Well then, one has to wonder, what, what about all those stories we hear about very good people and ethical people suddenly caught in a situation like stuck on a mountain in a avalanche, in a blizzard, don't have any food, and you see very good people suddenly turning on the weakest in their group, even resorting to, I don't even want to say it, cannibalism. It's not one incident, you find it more than one. And the situations where people in very dire circumstances, where you feel threatened, suddenly turn into beasts. And, and yes, we'll turn into a mob. You know, you all read Lord of the Flies with the children, a group of children, children not considered to be innocent, pure. There's a certain power of a mob that affects people. So yes, maybe in regular circumstances, you're not just drawing a lynch mob, but if it's a little irregular, what would you do? <clears throat> we'll take surveys at the end. <laughs> um, and then you have, of course, maybe the classical example, if I can call it that, of the 20th century, the Germans. 100 million Germans who consider themselves highly cultured, advanced society with science and medicine and art and music and philosophy. No, they consider themselves the fathers of emancipation, the fathers of uh, the enlightenment. And yet, they were able to turn into monsters. Yeah. Of course, the debate rages on whether all 100 million Germans were monsters. So recently, remember that book, Nazi, uh, Hitler's Willing Executioners, Goldhagen's Theory. Whether you adopt the theory that people are, uh, Germans are unique in some way, but one thing is for sure. However you look at it, there was a mob mentality, and many people were, the crime was not necessarily directly killing someone, but being silent in the face of it. And there are theories about people authority, that when police round you up and they tell you things, people just respond to authority irrationally. So if cops would round up 100 people, some statistics say those 100 people, they say shoot, hear these 10 criminals or prisoners, people have this blind ad adherence to authority. I'm not going into the psychological elements of it, or actually the psychological elements is what I do want to go to. I'm not going into whether people are guilty or not. There's no question we don't accept Eichmann's defense of, I just listened to authority, and therefore basically everybody was just listening to authority, so the only one responsible was the guy, Hitler himself, which of course is ridiculous because you can't do it yourself. But it's a study that perhaps, till the end of days, will continue to haunt us, of how perfectly fine human beings turned on their own neighbors simply because they were Jewish or they were gypsies or they were uh, homosexuals or whatever it was that they decided to stigmatize. So to just say that, hey, I wouldn't become part of the herd mentality is very nice. None of us would like to become, but history shows and history is witness to people very much stooping to a very low common denominator. That's on a very a very extreme sense. And let's talk on a more subtle sense. We live in a society where there's constant pressure on us. How would you be if you saw in your own office, your workplace, where the whole office turns on one person? Would you have the courage and the guts to stand up and defend that person if you knew it was you know, baseless? Or you'd just be quiet because your job may be on the line. You want to be accepted by everybody. 
How many people do you know would just get up there? Yes, it's like we all would like to get the medal for it, but I'm talking about when it's uncomfortable. And how many people have compromised their ideals by, uh, by becoming capable of backstabbing even best friends when you climb the ladder of success? Again, nobody wants to talk about these things, and nobody says, it's always everyone else. Nobody ever will acknowledge that I really was there, which just shows you how much denial there is around this. So these are tough questions, and they're usually not asked, definitely not of ourselves. And then, of course, just to add to the equation, to make the case, you see the effects, the subliminal or direct overt effects of advertising, marketing. We live in a world of, uh, of, of all these, uh, the impact of mass culture, of mass uh, of media, that affects all people. What you watch, how you dress, even mannerisms, behavior, and so on. So you have to wonder where is that, if there is, and if, and if there is, and where is that free spirit, if you really find somebody that stands up like that and is able to just say something that's completely different than everyone else. And when someone does, we consider them, we herald them, and, and, and hail them as, a, as leaders. So clearly this, is, this does touch a nerve, this whole story here with the scouts, where a group of 10 people who were leaders and perceived as such and were respected as such, Rashi even says, that when Moses sent them, in that moment they were actually kosher. Which means they were holy and they were, they were, they were uh, kosher meaning here, not kosher for, uh, for Passover or kosher for glau, kosher meat, meaning that they were kosher in the sense that they were pure. And their intentions were pure. They were not criminal. They were not malicious. By the way, uh, if you want, you can see me. There's a lot of seats. Or if you insist on not seeing, you know. It's all right. I'm just telling you there are options in life. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, they, so the question here, you see right here, a case study of 10 leaders. They come back. The Jewish people were not were expecting to hear a good report, or they were at least expecting to hear what these scouts would come back with a way of entering the promised land. And when they, together, ten of them, wasn't one of them, all came together and all um, slandered the, the Holy Land, the promised land, and to the extent where they uh, incited the people to want, not want to enter, you see what kind of effect they had. So even though Kalav and Yeshua were these lone two in, in rangers, who were different, and we'll talk about that, what made them different, why didn't they go along, what was the secret, but you suddenly, here you have maybe the first documented case study of mob mentality, herd mentality, where all the promises that they had heard, what they'd witnessed, remember they had witnessed the miracles of leaving Egypt, you know, you could have been a skeptic 210 years, generations in exile, it's one thing, one, but once they were redeemed from there, and they saw the parting of the sea. And they saw different miracles that took place. The Sinai. And still, ten people could come and incite them all. There you see how distorted all of us can become when there's a certain type of mob or herd type of uh, mass mentality. And these were, as I said, these were, these were evolved people. They're called the Dardea, a generation of knowledge, knowledgeable people. people. They were not uh, small people. They were great, great sages among them leaders and so on. So two individuals among millions were the only ones that stood up and uh, challenged. And they, as I said, were rewarded. They were the only two that ended up entering the promised land. So I think this is a great, great, uh, a great springboard, an opportunity to, to define and to figure out what it is about us all and how can we find that type of strength and fortitude to really be yourself. Now, this is a little tough subject, as I said before, more, more than a little tough, because most people simply will not acknowledge that they're not free and independent spirits. Most people think that they are not part of a herd or a mob. That's how it is. So then you get to, back to the problem of uh, have the cure of a disease is knowing it. If you're in denial and you're not even capable of acknowledging um, that you may be one of those type of people, you're definitely never going to free yourself from it. So the Torah, in its classic way, does not mince words, and talks about even these great men. You could think, why would the Torah tell us thousands of years later? Why do we need to know 
how they slandered the land. Why do we need to slander them in a way? Lashon Hara about them, even though they did something wrong. Because it's coming to tell you that nobody is immune to mob mentality. There's no such thing. Everybody is affected by it. Even these, t- ten, these ten great leaders, these, t- these giants who were the leaders, the Nisim, the leaders of their tribes, which means they were the, literally the leader, the greatest, most spiritual, advanced individual among thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. They too fell into this trap. And of course it became, once not only one person slandered it, not only one person, it was ten of them, it becomes a group. And once there's a group, there's a certain type of um, reinforcement, the vicious cycle of self-reinforcement that any mob contains. Like you start saying, well, if, if so many people are saying it, how could it be wrong? You know? Which so much affects many axioms and many truths, so-called truths that we embrace, where we simply accept it. Because everyone's saying, the New York Times says it, how could it not be true? If uh, so many people have accepted it, it must be true. Now, I'm not denying the fact that, yes, when a lot of people have reviewed something, it usually gives you a test of uh, so-called different, but who says they, all these people looked, uh, reviewed it? Maybe they, they, everyone's saying the same thing. Everyone's looking around and so looking at everyone else. The blind leading the blind, and new standards are being created, and then you start wondering who really initiated this? How did this become a reality? Look, millions and millions of people drink Coca-Cola. How many people would say this is some type of divine absolute truth that you have to drink Coke? And that's a simply innocuous, you know, almost a superfluous uh, example. How many more deeper truths, so-called truths, that we just accept to be reality? So th- don't ever underestimate the power of marketing. So you, all you have to do is see how enraged and how uh, passionate uh, sports fans become over something that has absolutely no significance in the real world. So there's all kinds of examples of how ridiculous people can be when it becomes a certain mass way of thinking. And uh, so the first lesson is, as we learn from these people, nobody is immune to this. So of course the big question is, so how did Kolov and Joshua really maintain their composure, maintain their independence to the threat of their own life? They were ready to kill them when they heard them starting to defend the promised land. In other words, here were two people who were not accepting what everyone else was saying. And as we all know, kill the witness. That's what criminals love to do. Instead of acknowledging a crime, there's one person who is, det- is a detractor. You consider him the criminal and say, kill him, kill the witness to the murder. Then it's as if it didn't happen. So this effect of the, of the group is a very powerful one. And uh, you know that story, the analogy they give of a great king who uh, gave notice that he was coming to visit a very small poor town. This was a big thing. A great leader coming to visit this poor town. So they were thinking of ways of how could they honor the king. They didn't have much. And what could they give him as a gift that he would value? So they came up with an idea that they, they can't give him something necessarily that's very precious because whatever they give him, he has more than they have. So they said, but the gesture he would appreciate. So they set up, they decided to set up a big barrel in the center of, the, of this town. And everyone in the town, as poor as they were, was expected to pour a goblet of wine into this barrel. And they would give the barrel of wine to the king as a gift. And he would appreciate and understand that, as poor as they were, you know, it's difficult for them to give wine. But they tried their best, and together they gave him this big barrel of wine. It was like a, a gesture, a token gesture. Of, of course, these Jews in this town were pretty smart, as usual. So uh, everyone said to themselves, uh, well, one guy said to his wife, he says, listen, since everyone's pouring wine anyway, why should we give up something so precious? How much wine do we have? You know, we have saved for Passover or for Shabbos. So we'll pour a cup of, we'll pour a, a bottle of water into the barrel. It'll be, it will be insignificant in the face of everyone else's wine. Now, of course, every family thought of the same brilliant uh, innovation. So yes, the king, the great king, came and he got himself a barrel of water. You know, this is the classic example, or the one about the Jewish rowing team that kept losing all the races, so they said, you know what? They said, go figure out how the non-Jews do it. They keep winning these races, these rowing races. So uh, they send a a Jewish spy, a scout, to check out some of these uh, Ivy League university rowing teams. And he comes back with a big secret. He says, listen, I got the secret. They have one guy yelling and everybody else is rowing. Which means by the Jews it was the other way around. Everybody was yelling and one guy was rowing. 
That's the secret. So, um, so there is that, that element when you see everyone, or you think everyone, you think no, you know, you, it becomes like a, a certain type of mentality where uh, you, you start losing the significance of your personal voice because you say there's a big group out there. They tell you know the guy that's walking along the beach and he's throwing uh, clams back into the water, you know, to keep them alive. When they get grounded in the beach, they get they die. So someone said, you know how many clams there are? Millions and millions on the beach. What, ma- what does it matter that you're going to throw a few clams back into the water? So the guy answered, he said, but for this clam it matters. <laughs> in other words, when you think in terms of numbers, six billion people on this earth, you start thinking, how significant can I be? Because even if I do have a voice, so what? Which is, of course, the first excuse why we don't protest. Because you say it wouldn't make a difference. There's too many people already protest, uh, arguing otherwise. As we all know, it's really an excuse, because what difference does it make? The fact is, if, if it's true, if you see, as I said, somebody in your office or somebody in your community is being uh, a witch hunt, is being stigmatized, or is being uh, targeted, the fact is, your own morality, your own ethics should dictate a type of uh, independence to be able to stand up. Of course, the next excuse is you don't want to jeopardize your own situation. And as I said earlier, when you really take it to an extreme, Subtly, you could say, okay, marketing, big thing, Coca-Cola, everybody drinks it. What's the big thing? But if you take it to the extreme, it's extreme ends up, can be life and death. As I said, look at the Germans in the 30s and 40s. And look at what happens in situations where people are very cri- in very crisis situations, I mentioned, uh, where people have resorted to cannibalism even, turning on one weaker uh, a member or one weaker part- person in the party, and you see everyone else doing it. So... And then I mentioned also the Lord of the Flies. Children, in particular, could also be very cruel, even though they're naturally kind. But when there's a mob, that's what happens. Sometimes I think back at some of the things we did as kids. It was very embarrassing. And you want to correct certain things, certain type of turning on some of our weaker teachers, so to speak. Um, and uh, it becomes, you become very cruel, even though you don't really, it's not malicious. But the fact is, it becomes a group against one. A very powerful it's very compelling, you feel accepted, you feel like a whole hero, when in truth is you're just participating in a lynch mob, in, in, in a subtle sense or in a larger sense of the word. So thank God we don't live in a world where most of us necessarily are tested in this way, but it is definitely a, a good challenge to our character to wonder about these things, especially in this week's chapter. So the first lesson is that nobody is immune to this, even these t- 10 great men, Ch- handpicked by Moses, and Baisha Shok Shayim Haisu, they were, at the time they, when they were sent, they were, they were uh, pure of heart. They didn't go with bad intentions. It wasn't like they were setting it up, that they would come back with a bad report. That was never their intention. But once they got frightened, or whatever it was that weakened them, they did become a mob, and they became a first minion. One of the reasons that we... Um, They're not coming here. One of the reasons we have a minion, a quorum of ten men, is a tikkun, is a type of repair for the minion that came together here, the ten men that came together in a plot, which is one of the reasons, by the way, why women are not part of a minion, because no women were part of this conspiracy. Interesting to note, it was men that plotted this. The slander, and uh, and uh, therefore we correct it, we repair it by a minion coming together to pray or other power that a minion has. A minion being ten people coming together. So all this um, you know, brings leads up to the big question: uh, besides what, what type of person are you? What is it the secret of the call of Yeshua secret? And can we really learn to uh, stand up? proud, discover who you are as opposed to what the community, your community, the peer pressure, the social pressure demands and expects of us to be yourself. That's the big issue. Can you be yourself? Here ended up being only two people ended up being themselves. And that's why they were the only two that were entering the promised land. The holy land is a place for being yourself. God didn't need people who are uh, 
um, herd ment ment mentality people in this holy land. As I said before, they wrote their own script. They chose to say that the land was not good enough, so they ended up not entering it. So on a very basic level, what distinguished Kolov and Yeshua was that, uh, as the Torah tells us, that Kolov, Moses prayed for Joshua. That's why it's called Yehoshua. This is, uh, as Rashi says, the name of God is there, that God should save him. Yehoshua means God should protect and save him. So Moses prayed for Joshua. Why Joshua? Because Joshua was his most devout disciple. He would be the person that would, uh, that would um, fill Moses' shoes. He was uh, Moses' successor. And he would lead the Jewish people into the promised land. And Kolov, the, ta the Torah also says, also went to pray at the grave of the Marat HaMachpela in Hebron. On their way into Israel, he stopped to pray at the grave of, the, of our patriarchs. In Hebron, if you've ever been, anyone been there? To Hebron? The burial spot of Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarah, J Isaac and Rebecca, and Jacob and, Re and uh, Leah. Rachel is buried on the road called Kever Rochel, on the road to Beit uh, that where that's where she was buried as the Bible documents and where you can see it till this day. And till this day they're still fighting over that area. So Kolov on his way into Israel stopped there to pray. So that's one thing that distinguishes these two that the other ten did not do. Now as I said, the other ten were not secular non-believers. They were actually great, great men. As a matter of fact, in Hasidic and Kabbalistic thought, it says one of their main intentions why they didn't want to go into the Promised Land was not they suddenly got scared of giants. You know, they had seen great miracles, these leaders. It was because of their spirituality that they didn't want to enter. Because they felt protected in the wilderness. Why do we need to go into a materialistic world, as I said, a land that consumes its inhabitants? They wanted to stay in the yeshiva, in the kolel. Why should they have to go into a... Uh, into the marketplace, into the Wall Street, where you have to deal with sharks, you have to deal with competition, corruption, all the temptations of the marketplace. They said, let's stay in this holy, let's stay in this protected, or protected by the clouds of glory. They had miraculous uh, food, bread from heaven, man. They had, um, they had miraculous water from the Be'er Shal Miriam, the, the wellspring of Miriam. So why do they need to go and, um, and enter this material universe? Which for them was, like a, it was, a degree, it was a descent. So you see their intention, though they were completely wrong, because God basically said, that's my purpose, is I want you to enter this world. Because their argument was basically, this world is too difficult for us. So really in a philosophical sense, it's like the question of every soul doesn't want to come down to this earth. Life is difficult. That's why you have in the mission it says, God decrees, God compels us to enter into, the, into this world. The soul on its own gravitates towards spiritual transcendence. And the same is true for the Talmud says there's a disagreement between the two great scholars, Shammai and Hillel, where one of them felt uh, that it's more pleasant to be born than not to be born. That's what Hillel said. Hillel always found the, the beauty in everything. And Shammai, who's harsher, also Torah-based, more Gvura, as opposed to Chesed of, of, of Hillel, said it's more pleasant not to be born than to be born. So he says, Nuach la'adam shalei nivra mishanivra. More pleasant. So the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Shneur Zaman, in the Kutit Torah, explains, more pleasant, but more purposeful is to be born. More purposeful is to come down into the challenges of this difficult world. And that's why a soul has to be forced, literally forced to come down to this world. It's a decree. And even while it's here, it has to be forced to remain here. Which is why we have the natural angst and the natural sense of um, transcendental urge, urges, yearnings to reach a greater place. Because the soul always feels this is not its home. This is the restlessness of a, of a healthy soul. It becomes unhealthy when the restlessness is not resolved and the restlessness can turn into angst, can turn into anxiety anxiety into depression. But that's really not the theme of this discussion, it's just to point out that the Miraglim, the, the scouts, their intentions were very uh, lofty ones. However, they were absolutely wrong. 
and their crime was great, precisely because they were so spiritual. You know, if it was just some type of materialistic fear, it's one thing you can forgive them for being afraid. It was precisely they were using there was a sense, a form of like selfish spirituality. They wanted to take care of their own needs instead of having to fulfill God's purpose in this world, which requires entering a difficult life, a harsh one, a cruel life. So, nevertheless, so the, as I was saying, this is their their pure intention. So, in that sense, you could say you know there was a very powerful force, but it was wrong, and more importantly, the mob part of it, that was the big mistake. So when we say that what distinguished Caleb, Kolov, Caleb and Joshua from them was one step further. They too were spiritual, but they went to pray. As I said, Moses prayed for Joshua, and Kolov went himself to pray at the, at the Maras HaMachpelah, at, at Hebron. And as a result, they had something that the others... Did. So why didn't the Maraglim go pray? If they were such spiritual people, they should have also gone to pray. You know, if they got scared of the materialism, why did they forget that God had promised this land? Remember, this promise was not some type of new promise. It goes back hundreds of years, back to Abraham. Every Jew, every man, woman, and child knew that the only reason we're here in Egypt, all those hundreds of years in exile, was because the God had sent Jacob down, but God had also promised Abraham that after 400 years of being in a land that's not yours, you will be redeemed, you'll leave with great treasures, and you'll march towards the promised land. They knew why they were in the wilderness. It wasn't like some mystery. As difficult as it was, they knew they where they were headed. What were they thinking? And how did Jacob, uh, Joshua and Caleb have the presence of mind to go pray? And why didn't they go pray if they were so spiritual as I just uh, emphasized? Because, as I said, there's a thing called spiritual selfishness. And when it becomes, uh, you become subjective, it blinds you. And the greater you are, the more blinded you become. Because you're great. You know, a person who doesn't see themselves so great you know, can always acknowledge that maybe I made a mistake, I have a blind spot. But when there's greatness, greatness can also go the other direction. Great, great souls can do great damage. The Talmud says, Kala gadl yitzre gadl mimeno. The greater the person, the greater is the Yetzirah. The greater is his challenges. Greatness has, is a double-edged sword. So there's a classic story of Rab Shimon Bayechai. I think I mentioned it a few weeks ago. Rab Shimon Bayechai is the hero of Lagba Omer, that period that day, the 33rd day of the Omer that happens between Passover and Shavuos. Great pilgrimages take place till this day in Miran, northern Israel. So Rashbi is the author and the, and the, of the classic Zohar, the classical text of the Book of Splendor of, of the, essentially, you could say, the father of Kabbalah. So the story is, Talmud tells is that uh, when the Romans decreed that uh, Jews were prohibited from studying Torah, he continued studying and spreading Torah. And because of that, they went looking to arrest and kill him. So he escaped and hid for 12 years. Him and his son, Rabbi Lazar, hid in a cave from the Romans. And there's a whole series of stories about how they survived. And obviously you can imagine they reached great, great uh, spiritual heights those years, studying, praying, connecting, completely separate from all civilization. So 12 long years. Then finally word came that the Roman emperor had died, the decree had been abolished, and now they were able to come back to uh, civilization. So here's the story, interesting episode. The Rajbi had become so pure in those years, so refined, that it says whatever he looked at as he returned back home, when he saw people, the, their involvement in the pettiness, in their superficial and, and stupid little lives, he uh, was, as I said, so enlightened that whatever he looked at, the Talmud says, began to burn whether it was physical or metaphorical, but the idea was his, his uh, spiritual eyes literally burned up everything around. So God says to him, no, that's not my uh, purpose. That's not why you spend 12 years um, in, a, in, a, in a cave being protected and hiding. You go back for one more year, a 13th year, bar mitzvah year. And there... You'll learn one more 
year of maturity, that when you come out, and that's what happened, when he came out, wherever he went, Rajbi went, he uh, repaired. Instead of burning, he fixed. So you'd think, which was the higher Rajbi? Who was the greater one? The one that was so um, spiritually refined that everything burned around him? Or the one that had the restraint to be able to fix? So if you think about it purely from a so-called firepower level, purely quantity, of course the 12th year Rajbi had that type of power. It's pretty amazing. He couldn't tolerate anything that was not holy, not pure, anything that was stupid or petty or meaning or insignificant, superficial. The truth is, however, qualitatively speaking, uh, he was much higher level the 13th year because his restraint was not that he became suddenly uh, um, uh, compromising or he compromised his values and standards. He didn't go down a level, he went up a level. He went up a level realizing that he cannot be consumed with his own spiritual state of being. That's good for him, not good for anyone else. It's like who's the greater teacher? The teacher that can reach the lowest student or the teacher that can only teach great students? So the teacher that can bring metaphors and explain something even to kindergarten children, even ABC level, is a teacher who has such profound understanding that he's able to package it in the simplest of terms. They said Richard Feynman, the great physicist, was able to do that. Deceptively simple analogies from things that we see every day in the most complex, to explain most complex quantum mechanics and so on. So it says about King Solomon, his wisdom was that he was able to give 3,000 metaphors for any piece of, for any idea. And Hasidic thought explains 3,000 metaphors, not 3,000, he was so creative he had 3,000 different examples. 3,000 levels of examples. He was able to reach 3,000 levels lower than himself. You know, most of us may be two, three levels. 3,000 levels is almost unfathomable. Meaning to be able to reach so, meaning a metaphor for a metaphor for a metaphor for a metaphor 3,000 times down. That is both how profound he was and how he was able to package and present an idea without diluting it, without compromising it. That's, of course, the key. Now, the student may not see yet the, bre the depth in the metaphor and the example. But years later, a good teacher, it's planted in there. And when you suddenly say, aha, and you get it, you realize what kind of teacher you had, what kind of master, what kind of was able to feed you or give you, spoon feed you in a, in a, small, in a, small, uh, a small dose. But it had this potency that has like a um, delay reaction. And as you get older and you start maturing and understanding, it's a whole different uh, dimension. So Rav Shimon Bayechai reached the stage where they say not a tzaddik in pelts. When it's cold in the room, a tzaddik in pelts is a tzaddik who puts on a fur coat. So he keeps himself warm. Um, I know this is a metaphor for the winter, not really fitting for today, but the idea, you get the idea. Uh, let's put it this way. I don't know if it's the equivalent of a, of a uh, air conditioner that just cools you and nobody else. I don't know. But at least uh, a, a fur coat warms you and nobody else. And a, a tzaddik, a, real, a higher level tzaddik is someone who turns on a fireplace. So the whole room gets warm, including him. It's a distinction. Now the first tzaddik, at least he's not able to warm himself. Some people can't even do that. But the purpose of existence is not to just illuminate yourself or to warm yourself. It's to illuminate everything around you. Now of course this is not just a blanket statement. Everyone has to know where their stage is at. That's why some people... You may be at a stage where you need to first uh, reinforce and uh, fortify your own uh, self. But there's no such thing as a person only doing one. We all are obligated to do both. You know, every morning, we only have one Shabbos in the week. Even though some people would argue it would be nice to have six days Shabbos and one day work day. But the purpose of existence is not Shabbos. The purpose is six days of the week, the work. To be infused with the power and the spirit of Shabbos. So we begin each day with prayer. So it gives us, it fortifies us. But the goal is then to bring the energy into the rest of the day, into the workplace, into a corrupt world, into a world that is antithetical sometimes to the holy, to the sacred, to the divine, and, and there to illuminate. So this is the miraglim, you could say, were like Rajbi in the first 12 years. They were very holy. As I said, they, when they went out on their mission, they were pure, good intentions. But when they saw materialism, not just read about it, and they saw it, they saw land that it consumes its inhabitants, that was too much. So all the defenses went up. And then the next thing happened was the mob mentality. 
So here's a mob mentality that you can say is a holy mob, but that also is unacceptable. Caleb and Joshua understood and therefore prepared themselves, preempted it by going to pray at the grave of, uh, well, Joshua, but Moses prayed for him, and uh, Caleb went to pray at the grave of the patriarchs. In a Hasidic story they tell of um, a chassid. There was a, two young, uh, uh, bright uh, scholars came to a town, and they, it was Friday, and Friday afternoon before Shabbos, some people, Hasidim, have the custom to go to the mikveh, a ritual bath. So the, these two young guys ask, where's the mikveh? And this was a cold shtetl in Russia, in midwinter, frosty winter day. So they said, you know, in truth, during the winter, very few people, go, nobody really goes to the mikveh because it's at the bottom of a hill, which is all covered with ice, very slippery. They said, no one in the entire town goes to the mikveh shop for shopping. He said, well, there's one old chassid who lives at the edge of town, he goes. No one really knows how he makes it, but he does. Now, they were two, as I said, scholars and smart Alex as well. They were skeptical. They, they, so they decided they're going to follow this guy. Yeah. They, they wait outside his house. They see he's going, so they follow behind him. And yes, lo and behold, they start walking down, marching down this mountain. It's not exactly simple. He makes it all the way down without a hitch, even though he's oh, over 80 years old. These two uh, young 20, in their 20s, one of them slipped and broke an arm. The other one, you know, they just couldn't make it. They come to Shul Shabbos, they come to Shul Shabbos, they ask this man, you know, they said, how did you, uh, you, an older man, make it down this mountain, the slippery slopes, when we couldn't make it down there? <coughs> so he answered, without nonchalantly, without even any airs about him, he said, in Yiddish, he said, When you're uh, bound, when you're tied above, you don't fall below. That was his answer. Now, obviously, it didn't mean that he was physically tied. It meant, on a deeper level, that when you're connected to something higher than you are, so no matter what happens below, you don't fall. In one of the Hasidic discourses, the previous Lubavitch Rebbe gives an example. He says, that, you know, that, that the mitzvahs, they're sometimes compared to lifelines. They're compared to lifelines. Each mitzvah is like a, is like a, a rope that connects us to a higher world where we live in this world and we're on our own, it's very difficult to navigate. No matter if you, even if you're an ethical person, a good person, we all got our challenges, as I discussed at length earlier. We all can get trapped in the mob mentality. You know, I will soon discuss, here we're talking even a good mob mentality. But so you can get trapped in that type of place. So he gives the analogy of a diver, of those deep sea divers, not scuba diving. The ones that go down, you know, with a pipe, what do they call them? Uh, the Navy divers, whatever, is their name for it? David, do you have a name for it? Those guys, you know, they go down, right? Helmets. With the helmets, right. And they don't go with an with a, with a oxygen on their backs, they have the pipe. So it's interesting, he gives this analogy that obviously they're very cognizant every given moment uh, of their uh, life source. Because for one second, something happens to that pipe that's connecting them to the, to the above the sea, they're in deep trouble, life-threatening. So he explains that if we were all conscious like that, of like a deep-sea diver of our lives, how much we're dependent, not optional, dependent on a higher source, it would be a different type of life. But we're blinded, we don't see it. You know, the Talmud says, A person does not sin unless a moment of insanity enters into them. Now, this is not, uh, uh, an, this is not a, um, an answer or excuse in a court of law to plead insanity. Because it doesn't mean that a person is insane. It means that the, the temptation, the seduction of the moment, and all its passion is so powerful, obsession, that it blinds you to the point that that moment you're insane. The reason we are still guilty is because you can control. You don't have to allow yourself to go there, as, as powerful as it is. But that's the power of a moment. And we all know from ourselves when you get consumed with something, as, much, as, as irrational as it is, 
And even knowing at the moment that, at the end, that you may regret it later, even knowing at the moment that it's all instant gratification, you still make the mistake. In Tanya he says that we all have the two voices inside of us that are at war with each other. The voice of the divine, the voice of the animal soul. And he says that the divine soul rests in the mind, so it has the element of reflective abilities, self-control. Mind over matter, the mind ruling the heart. As uh, Lawrence Taylor famously said when he was playing, he used to play uh, quite hurt as a linebacker for the Giants. So I asked him, how do you play hurt? So he says, mind over matter. When you don't mind, it doesn't matter. Tanya, obviously, has a different take on the mind over matter, which is more simply self-control. Um, and he says there, so therefore, we have natural self-control. So even though we have a voice inside of us that's impulsive, that comes from the heart and it's emotional drive, but we have the power to counter that with reflecting and self-control. Then he goes on and says that there's that two judges inside of each of us, the divine soul and the animal one. And then the God serves as the third judge. And the third judge who... Uh, in other words, uh, uh, mediate, uh, not mediates, who um, creates the majority consensus, always will side with the divine soul, so you'll have two against one. That's what he says in Tanya. And the obvious question that everyone asks is, so why, if that's the case, it's two against one, why is it that we're constantly uh, listening to the other voice, the minority? And the answer, or one of the answers, answer that I uh, prefer is... Uh, because, you know, you don't remember, uh, uh, they call the kangaroo courts, uh, or uh, I guess in the times of the Soviet Union, there was also a court of law. The only thing was, there was only a prosecutor. There was no defense. So you had a prosecutor, and you had a whole bunch of series of uh, allegations, and then you had to confess. That was the only option you had. Either you confess or you get killed. And if you confess, you also got killed. So that was what's called, a, you know, of course, a court of law. Now imagine... Uh, the same thing here. This is the power. When you have an impulse to do something, you don't allow the defense attorney, your mind, to come and say, you know what, give me equal time to give you, present you an equal case the other way around. Think the last time that you made a mistake. Did you really give equal time to another voice to wonder? Most mistakes are done impulsively. They're so powerful that you don't give any time. You don't think about it. Someone insults you. Someone says something to you, something happens, you see something, you're tempted, you're seduced, whatever it is. If you would just take five minutes, ten minutes, overnight, think about it, it will always abate, it will always weaken. The biggest mistakes are made because we don't think about it, because it, can't, it so conquers, your, conquers you, so consumes you, that you don't give any equal time. The equivalent of a court where there's only one voice, and you don't let the other lawyer speak. You don't let the other attorney say his opinion. If you did, then God would always side with the other one, there'd be two against one. Instead, you basically have one against zero. That's the, the problem. So that's up to us to allow that voice in. And this is a, a method that you can use even in simple things like telemarketing or other people trying to sell you something. So you'll always see.